This is our first look at the human body's integumentary system. The integumentary system is the outermost organ system of the body and it includes all of the kind of external features that you can see from the outside. So we're talking about skin, hair, and nails primarily, and then there are some glands and nerve cells and other things in, within the skin that we'll talk about more as we continue. Um, one interesting thing about the integumentary system is that the skin happens to be the largest organ in the human body, which most people don't think about. Um, if you are a full-sized adult, and many of you are quite close, and we could remove all of your skin, it would weigh almost 20 pounds in total, which is pretty impressive. The integumentary system and the skin in particular have several very important functions. The first is the maintaining of homeostasis, so trying to keep things in balance within the body. So the two things that we are mostly talking about in terms of skin is maintaining temperature at about 37 degrees Celsius and maintaining an appropriate level of water balance for all of the cells inside the body. The other really important um, job of the skin is to provide protection. So we are talking about injury, we're talking about um, infection, and we're talking about um, homeostasis. So we need to keep all of those things protected. Some of the ways that the body can tell whether there is damage or um, possible harm in the environment is by detecting or measuring what's happening in the world around us. We do that using nerves, and those nerves are also called sensory receptors. So that helps tell us what's going on in the world around us and what's going on within the body itself. Some of the features of the skin or jobs of the skin that people don't often think about are that the skin works as a little factory. It helps to make chemicals. And two of the chemicals are vitamin D, which is really important in um, the functioning of the body, and then also um, quite a few different hormones. We'll talk more about that later on. And then finally, it, the excretion of waste. This is done primarily through the production of sweat. So the integumentary system is made up of a certain type of tissue which is just a group of cells, and this tissue is called epithelial tissue. It's different from other kinds of tissues in a couple of ways. The first one is that there are no blood vessels within epithelial tissue. That is a um, characteristic called avascular. So a means not, vascular means blood. So what that means is that these cells have to absorb their food, their water, their oxygen from the blood supply in other nearby tissues. Um, that means that they don't bleed, they don't generally have very good nutrition flow, and unless they are very, very close to the blood supply of some other tissue type. Um, another really common feature of epithelial tissue is the division of cells. So the cells grow quickly, they reproduce quickly, they divide quickly, and they die relatively quickly. This is really important for skin because our skin is constantly being replaced and repaired. It's in constant contact with the environment, so it's getting scraped, it's getting bumped, it's getting slivers, it's getting all kinds of um, just friction contact with clothing, for example, and so it constantly needs to be repaired and replaced. These cells are also very tightly packed, and you'll see a picture of this in a moment. And what that does is it helps to prevent germs and things from getting in, which is part of how it helps to protect the inside of the body. That's skin's job, or one of the job, jobs of the skin. Um, some of the other functions are to move around um, the materials that are made by the skin. So I told you in the last slide about secretion. So this tissue helps with that job. And excretion, those are both things that we just spoke about before with sweat and with other hormones. Um, the average lifespan 
of a human epithelial cell is about 100 days. However, skin cells have a much shorter lifespan. They only live for about 28 days. So here you can see a picture. If we took a chunk out of your skin and looked at it from the side, that's called a cross-section view. Here's a cross-section view of the three layers of the skin. The outermost layer is called the dermis, or pardon me, is called the epidermis. I'm going to mark that with an E. So it's from that red line up to the outside, and it is um, just packed with those epithelial tissue cells really closely together and no blood whatsoever. The next layer is called the dermis. It's the thickest layer because it has many different tissue types. So it has what's called a basement membrane. So that helps attach the epidermis onto the dermis so that it's held in place. And then it has a whole bunch of other tissue types. We've got connective tissue, which um, helps to attach all of the other types of tissue together. We've got more epithelial cells. There's muscle tissue, which allows for the skin to shiver, for example. And there's nervous tissue, which helps to detect what's happening in the environment. And then we have blood vessels for the delivery of nutrients and water, as well as oxygen and the removal of waste. Finally, the innermost layer is called the subcutaneous layer, and that is made almost exclusively of big blood vessels and a whole bunch of fat. So the fat is nice and soft, and what that does is it helps to keep us warm, and it also gives a cushion so that we are less likely to injure ourselves from contact on the outside. So the subcutaneous layer is very, very involved in protection. So if we could zoom in that cross section that we just looked at to the epidermis, you would see the epithelial cells all packed in like this. Um, all over the body, there are places where skin is very thick and places where skin is very thin, but no matter how thick or thin it is, there's generally the same four layers. You can see the names of those layers listed over here. The innermost layer, we can see right here, is called the basal layer. And that's where new cells are born. So these are brand new cells growing and dividing. And as they age, they move upward. So as they age, they get a little bit more stretched out and a little bit more flat. And by the time they get all the way to the surface of the skin, they're very, very, very flat, very, very, very old. And they are basically dried out because they are filled with this protein called keratin. Keratin is very, very tough and it's also waterproof. So that process of filling up with keratin is called keratinization. So as the cells move from the inside to the outside, they get more and more filled with keratin. That helps to protect the skin, it helps to uh, keep water inside the body, and it is very good at um, handling friction. In places where there's a lot of contact with the environment, like the palms of the hands, the bottom of the feet, there will often be an extra layer of epithelial tissue called the lucidum, and that just provides a little bit of extra support. So one of the um, jobs that we talked about at the beginning, I told you, was the production of chemicals. This is another chemical that the skin actually makes. So we have these particular cells called melanocytes, and those cells live at the very, very bottom layer of the epidermis, next to all the fresh, young, healthy, newly developed cells. And so in this picture, the melanocyte is this kind of green, sort of jellyfishy or amoeba-looking cell. It's right here. The job of the melanocyte is to produce a chemical called melanin, and melanin gives our bodies it, our skin color. The more melanin that's made, the darker a person's skin. 
Something that's really interesting is all people, whether you are this guy, let's say in the green, or this guy in the red, or this guy in the blue, they all have exactly the same number of mel melanocytes. These cells are exactly the same, but they don't all have as much pigment created. So it's basically like having a whole bunch of empty factories and only some of the factories are making chemicals. The other factories are just kind of hanging out empty. So what we end up seeing from that is differences in skin tone. So people with African skin tones make a whole bunch of melanin, so lots of melanin, and it happens to be dark melanin, so mostly dark brown and black. People of Asian descent tend to make kind of medium amounts of melanin, and it tends to be more brown and kind of yellow in tone. And then Europeans make very little melanin, so their skin tends to be much lighter, more kind of yellow and tan. If there is very little melanin, so not a lot of color in the skin, sometimes you'll get a little bit of a pinkish glow because um, the blood vessels that are running at the bottom of the skin through the subcutaneous layer, they are very, very, very red. And so by the time that red kind of coloration comes through all the layers of the skin, it makes the skin look a little bit pink. In the middle layer, that layer I told you that has all different kinds of tissue types, the dermis, is um, a bunch of different types of tissue that have very important jobs. One thing that is really interesting about the dermis is the border between the dermis and the epidermis. So let's say everything above this border is epidermis. Why won't that let me make an E? There we go. And everything below is dermis. That border is bumpy because it is made up of a group of cells called the dermal papillae. Those bumps form when a human is growing basically inside the womb. So fetuses develop hands when they are very, very young, right around um, two months old. And so as they are using their little hands, they're exploring their environment and they're often rubbing the walls of the womb where they live. The womb is not smooth. It uh, has some texture to it. So as these teeny tiny little fingers with, with brand new skin are rubbing up against this textured wall, they end up taking on some of that texture permanently. And it creates this pattern that you know as fingerprints. That because every fetus rubs the wall differently and because every wall is textured slightly differently, that means all humans have their own, their own unique fingerprints, even identical twins. It is the only characteristic within the human body that is completely unique from person to person. Some of the other characteristics of the dermis, I told you before, there's lots of blood vessels so that we can get nutrition and we can remove waste. It's very important that those blood vessels are constantly um, moving blood and getting access to the tissues. There's also nerve cells to help detect things in the environment like temperature, texture, whether something is sharp or hard or soft or hot. The nerves that are within the dermis help to detect all of these things. And it is also where the body grows hair and where the body produces sweat glands, or produces sweat, pardon me. We'll talk more about that in the next lecture. But the last interesting detail about the dermis has to do with tattoos. Because the dermis is deep within the skin, it never gets shed. The dermal cells stay forever. They repair and they replace, but they don't get released from the body. So when a person gets a tattoo, that ink is injected. So if this was the skin, it gets injected all the way down here into the dermis where the skin cells are permanent. Thus, the tattoo is also permanent. That is it for our lecture today. Don't forget to write two to three questions for discussion in class and use these questions above 
to help guide your summary. All of the answers to these questions should be in your notes. Thanks, and I'll see you soon.